<laughs> Hello, folks. Uh, we'll get started at about five after. Hey, Oliver. Welcome, Kishore. Morning, Taylor. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning. We'll get started about two minutes after. You can add your name and any agenda items to the meeting notes, which are posted into the Zoom chat. Hello, greetings everyone. Um, let's see, we'll get started here in just a moment. You can add your name and any agenda items, or if you have an agenda item, you can say it out loud. Posted that into the Zoom chat. Welcome, Michelle and Ben. Hey, Frederick and Ann. Hey. All right, Ann. All right, I'm just opening the agenda to give me a moment. And, uh... No problem. Right. There we go. And then I I'll could be start. here to help you, but I'll let you, I'll turn it over to you to lead. Good morning, everybody, and apologies for being fraction late. Uh, let me try and share this, but it looks like I can't share today, I'm afraid. Um, 
Right, so uh, if, if it's not a problem for you, um, Taylor, could you do the sharing while I do the yeah, talking? Yeah, I'll share the screen. Yeah, sorry, new laptop. It's forgotten all of its sharing permissions. Um, no worries. Right, um, so um, the first item is simply the upcoming events as usual. Uh, we've got um, KubeCon imminently. Um, so uh, yeah, KubeCon at the end of the week, uh, that's the China version. So for those of you who are a little bit more in a civilized time zone and who have signed up to it, I hope you'll go to that. I don't know if anyone's got any um, uh, specific sessions they want to um, raise while they're here. I see we have one listed in the minutes there if anyone's interested. Nope, fair enough. And then for uh, a second round of everything happening in Asia, then it looks like we have the Open Source Summit in Japan as well, um, which looks like it's going to be um, next week. Uh, then beyond that, uh, we've got uh, a round of things coming up next year, which uh, you can read as well as I can. So um, you're good. Um, other than that, apparently we have zero agenda items. So what I'm going to do is have a look and see if we've got anything on the pull requests. Does anyone have anything that they just want to speak out loud and we can add? Well, got a very quiet meeting today then. This is going to be very quick if we don't uh, think of something soon. Um, is my audio coming through? Yes. All right. Yeah. So if anyone has any topic, just anything you want to talk about regarding CNS, Cloud Native, um, we can just add that or look into something. If you got questions about something, we can put it on the agenda. Hey Taylor, uh, good morning. Um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I wanted to check with you on the proposal thing. I think we had a brief conversation over the email. Uh, can you share uh, more details about that? Um, is there any link or something that I can go through? Regarding um, contributions, I think there's a couple of topics. The con talk uh, contributions to the working group or the blogging, I don't know. We had a couple of things going. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So what was the specific question or topic on that? And just add it in and we'll dive into it. OK. Yeah, I wanted to basically know the topics um, for the proposal, right? Um, yeah, let me add. Okay. It to mm -hmm. Best practice ideas. Yeah. Uh, All right. Okay. Just make sure we're covering the right um, the right one. Okay. So, just what is the? How would this? How do you do it? What's the process and what's involved? Is that, is that kind of the question? How to do it? How to contribute best practice? Okay. Is that the question? How to contribute best practices? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so best practice, yeah, I got the topic. So what I'm currently working on, right? Uh, I think as discussed in our previous meetings, I was basically, uh, working on um, um, integrating our Kiverno um, into CNCF. And also we have a bunch of best practice uh, policies uh, that that can, you know, uh, be used uh, to, uh, as a part of uh, policy testing, we can use those best practice uh, Kiverno policies. Um, and uh, I think that that is one way of contributing, I think. But uh, maybe we I can come up with a write up, um, you know, and uh, share it with you, and then we can decide on that. 
All right. Um, so it might be good to, I, I guess, for folks on this call that haven't um, seen, give a little bit of background. So Kyverno um, is a project that can, it's a policy, uh, can, I guess, a policy agent for Kubernetes, and you can set different policies. There's different, uh, I guess, projects out there like OPA and other things that can do it in a different way. And Kyverno is one of them. Um, and there's been some interaction with Kyverno and the, uh, the CNF test suite around testing and checking things. Um, so with regards to the working group, I think what we'd be looking at is not the test specifically, but what, why are you testing something? Like what is the best practice behind it that um, that we would want to capture and tell people you should try to cover this, whether they end up using Kyverno or um, directly, the idea would be if there's a, a practice like, oh, this is the wrong one, although that one's good too. Um, there's a practice that's recommended that we all recommend. So this is the one that's been published that we can point out, so non-root. So there could be many different ways to test for the use of root users and containers that a process is being run as root versus a, a non-root user, or potentially a related thing would be users above UID 1000. And there's many different ways that you could test this with different there's different projects that try to test this, including uh, Cubescape, which we got Ben on the call from Cubescape. Falco does some testing around that. There's a lot of different ways. So the best practice we're not recommending in the working group, we're not recommending the use of specific projects. Uh, that's up to implementation. It's the best practice in general. So we'll say, don't run not um, your process as root. Well, user may say, we're using this project that does rootless containers. Or they say, oh, we've, um, we've refactored and broken things up and we do it, we handle it in some other way. Um, so whatever the best practice is, someone could implement in multiple ways. And then of course, we'd like to be able to test in different ways so that we're ca catching all the different maybe edge cases and different ways that something may uh, be seen. But this would kind of be the goal. And um, I, I can stop there or we can kind of dive into process that um, many of us know, I guess, from the working group side. I think the least privilege, probably the session notes, and that we worked on is, I've been giving this as a reference for many people. I keep opening this wrong one. Let's get rid of that. Done, go away. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm just looking at the Kiverno website and list of policies that it's got, which effectively says, you know, these are things you could be doing to a container as to a pod as it starts. And the question would be the open question between those policies and what we're talking here would be, what is the need for doing that in the first place? What helps with that? Um, and, you know, why does using one of those policies improve matters? Why would you want to make it a default of the cluster? Um, so you've kind of got to join the dots between, well, you know, we strongly recommend you do X. And um, the reason we recommend you do X is this reason. Right. Okay. And can you give an example of a policy and we can take a look at it? Um, I guess they have a best practice category. Why not that one? Yeah, there um, is one example we can take a look, Taylor, is dropping all capabilities. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if you go down, I think there must be, yeah, drop all capabilities. There you go. All right. 
So this would be, um, I mean, it's literally labeled in your category best practices. So if we said this was a, um, a best practice that we think the CNF working group should promote, it's a recommendation for um, service, providers, service providers to adopt and say, we want everyone that's creating these. And it's a best practice for people creating these networking applications to adopt when they're building them. So we're saying, we think you should drop all capabilities. Then what we're gonna wanna do is go through and, and communicate that. So this is kind of the quick summary, which would be related to um, what, you're, what you're going for here, capabilities right here. So all of these should be a drop. That's kind of the summary. And then you go in and talk about the motivation. Here's our goals. So how is this gonna help? So we're wanting to communicate to the end user, why, do, why are we proposing that you drop all capabilities. And then you can okay. kind of go in here and talk, talk about it. Uh, one of the important areas is gonna be a user story or a use case. So for the non-root, there's a whole bunch of reasons to do it. We have a set of user stories under this area called supply chain attacks. So then this, these also could be applied to other best practices but the non-root is referencing them because we're saying if you have a compromised update, you have some type of security bug in the, the application, then if, if you're running non-root, then it's going to have less effect. Mm. Probably, um, just by thinking about this, these drop-all capabilities would be able to also reference that same set of user stories because if you have... If you've dropped all capabilities and you have a supply chain attack of some sort, then you, they're going to cause less damage. So potentially this whole section here on non-root would be usable for a best practice of drop all capabilities. Yeah, I, I think mm -hmm. the, the question I, I that's coming up, the, the question that's coming up in my mind, if you were to use Folco, is what you're doing is effectively of changing default well, you're changing default behavior of Kubernetes in as much as a container that would run on a Kubernetes without Falco will not run in the way you expect. Sorry, not Falco, Caverno. Uh, will not run in the way you expect if Caverno is running, right? If a container requires capabilities, then, you know, thinks it requires capabilities, expects capabilities, then Kiverno will either prevent it from running or make it run in a way that it's not expecting. So the question is, how do we fold kind of enforced policy information like this that would either modify or prevent a pod from running with uh, an application that does not expect that to be working? Are we saying, for instance, that we insist that Kiverno is installed with a set of policies on any pod that you use for network functions? Yeah, so this so one, there... uh, yes. So basically, uh, this policy that drop all, uh, that's going to uh, initially uh, drop all the um, capabilities and only add the ones that you need uh, based on your application requirements. Uh, that way, you know, um, uh, the we, we, we are explicitly mentioning the capabilities that we only need, but before that, we need to drop all the capabilities. Mm. Uh, I mean, another example of a similar thing that Kiverno seems to want to offer is, for instance, preventing anything from accessing the host namespace, which, to my mind, is a very good idea, um, because if I allow a pod to access the host namespace, I'm basically giving it the power to destroy the cluster or alternatively escalate its um, uh, privilege in a, um, the sense of, uh, you know, find out what else is going on in the cluster, modify the cluster, change the cluster's behavior in a way that means that the infrastructure is not independent of that application. It might break because of this application. So policies like that are potentially a good idea. Um, however, if you are going to say that you should use Kiverno on every cluster to ensure this happens, or even 
you know, Kiverno is an option to use on a cluster, then it comes with consequences because an application may, you know, there are three actors here. There's the people providing the infrastructure, the people providing the application and the operators. If the infrastructure prevents things that the application developers did not expect, then, um, you know, the, the operator is going to find when they bring the two things together, the application doesn't work. Um, so okay. you might argue that another way of phrasing this would be to say, you shall not use this. And then a best practice would be use Caverno to enforce that. Right. So, I think no, I the, Kiver um, the Caverno so part should be separated so that there's, if you're, we can have a suggestion, a recommended, you should drop all capabilities. And then we we're checking for that. And as far as someone that says, hey, we want to have as much of these as possible, then we could say, oh, you did great. And then for those who say, no, you must, it's required, we will not let you, similar to non-root. So on some platforms, they don't allow root. SC Linux platforms, you can't run as root. So a service provider could say, no, we will not allow it. And we're going to have deny by default. And for those, they could require that. But I would say the requirement to drop all capabilities should, could be, it could be a completely separate um, like requirement from, I guess it's, it's, a, it's a different decision to say it's a must versus a recommended. And a different yeah. one again, to basically modify the containers that think they're gonna get privileges to enforce that they're not as well. Um, you know, checking that they do drop privilege is one thing, adding the drop command is a separate thing. So there's there's also a difference. Or reject them. You just so don't allow it to deploy. There, there's also another thing to consider as, as well. So the drop all capabilities, even if you don't end up enforcing it and saying it's a must, you are able to, to say that if, uh, if drop all capabilities uh, fails, as in you, you decide that you don't want to run the drop all capabilities, but you still see that the test itself that determines whether capabilities are present fails, then that could trigger an audit and that, you con that gives you a, an inventory of everything that doesn't meet your, uh, your uh, best practice. And you may have exceptions as to why you don't uh, end up dropping all capabilities. And some of those exceptions may never be resolved but at the very minimum, it gives you an ablay of where your of, of where some of your your risk is at. So it's not just uh, everything like uh, I, don't run it if, if it doesn't fail or if, if it doesn't pass. It could be just audited if if, if it doesn't pass. Right. I think uh, uh, so. These all these policies, right? They can be run in two modes: either enforce or audit mode. So you can, uh, let's say you don't want to uh, run it against the workloads, you can basically run it in audit mode. That way it will just generate a policy report saying that, hey, this particular resource violated this uh, policy and here are the details. But that workload will still be able to run it. Um, so that, that should not really block you from running your applications. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think- can we can we um, go back to maybe start building some potential ideas um, based on these? Like we, we put out best practices. Yeah, I, I think that we have to differentiate between best practices and what is enforced. These are two completely different things. And I, ask, and I agree with Ian that, Ian that, that um, that the, that there are uh, that we can break applications, but and, and it's not generally not a good idea. We have to, but as best practice, it is a best practice to drop all capabilities. It is it is uh, it is the best thing to do. But you have application which must have those capabilities, so mm -hmm. you can't with either. Yeah, yeah I, I think all I would say is that what we're doing here right now is probably rules which are defined by their exceptions. So the auditing possibility here that this is fishy and you need to understand why this is happening is probably more useful to us than you ain't going to do this and we're going to stop you. Um, I would love one day for 
there to be a platform where in fact you can't have capabilities it's simply not possible but the problem with a platform like that right now is given there aren't very many options for running cnfs then i don't think you get a cnf to run on it because they're all going to want a privilege for some reason um so the auditing possibility seems like the more useful one yeah the in in general uh when you model trust in in this area because the the entire goal of for this type of a of an auditing path is is to determine do i trust this thing and for and how do i trust it and so generally you want to we don't have enough information here to be able to tell what the context is, uh, whether a given thing should or should not have privileges. So instead, we have to enable the operators to be able to tell whether to have the conversations as to whether they should trust something or not. The second part of on, on it is is time based because uh, things change over time. So how long do I want to trust? Uh, do I want to trust something for? Uh, there's a there's a third aspect of trust, which is whether it's symmetrical or what trust is not symmetrical, but that's we'll leave that part out. So just based on the first two, uh, what generally from an audit perspective, what we want to be able to say is this thing will run and we'll give it an exception for a period of time. Uh, it's best practice to re-review the uh, uh, the capabilities on a regular basis. So that way that you continue to understand your, your infrastructure and you could also make different decisions where maybe there's an update and you don't need these privileges anymore then you can drop them. So uh, so I would add a time-based component to any to any audit in, in this particular path if, uh, uh, or, or to any exception to, to this path. Well, the, the other thing that I was thinking, and also is regarding what Fred said, said uh, um, is uh, where are the, uh, well, um, Taylor mentioned about different um, implementations. So obviously, if those implementations uh, can allow us to treat those exceptions as, as um, Fred mentioned, or uh, do they need to modify the way to handle those exceptions or, um, so I think that we have to be also connected with the, the current implementation. Uh, you talk about Kiberno, Falco. Um, so can we do those things there or we have to request changes or? Uh, where would the changes be? Well, I, I was just thinking- Are you in saying the, in the projects? No, yeah, in, in the projects, like, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, if, Ideally, we have a two-way conversation going between, or multi-way, so between projects and the working group, between projects and the test suite, which turn to test those practices, we want to have a two-way conversation and, and improve the projects, um, as well as improve the best practices and the test happening. And then, of course, we, we also want the same with people creating CNFs or consuming them, the service providers. It sounded like there was a, a proposal for a um, for something around uh, using having policies of some type and there's different policy engines so having policies and creating and having them run and do checks on a regular basis <laughs> and i don't know exactly what we would say on that um because you could say they run policy checks run on every deployment policy checks run but you know what happens if someone pulls in updates that on and it it does an in inline update so do you want to check every hour do you want to check every day and have alerts or are you just running a report and sending a report once a week so there's a lot of different ways to do it but it seems like we could potentially write something up um, I don't even know if this is would become a best practice. It might become like more of a 
Required. Just another document, a white paper or document that we could. So we don't just have to create. <laughs> uh, we we can create these best practices that we're doing, like this. We have user stories that we're doing. We could also have other documents where we talk about. You should do audits and regular checks and policy stuff. We could have a paper written up just about policies. Are there any other? Um, practices that we want to write out and we can take them straight out of this or someone has some other ideas um taylor uh you remember i had two i had we discussed two shortly two ideas regarding the network best practices around the protection of the uh kubernetes control plane i don't know if we should talk discuss this here sure. or what are they um let's just add them in yeah, so um, there were- Or you can put them in this, you can drop them right yeah. here in the- Yeah, so I will try to do it in parallel, but but to, you know, to put you into the discussion, um, uh, the idea was, well, we have two basic network uh, protection concepts, very, very basic protection concepts around the, the control plane of Kubernetes. One is the API server protection. Um, making sure that the API you know, server is only um, um, answering authenticated users and uh, doesn't enable insecure port and stuff like that. Um, what, what is the control? It, the, the, uh, there is no... Um, there is not one yet? In, uh, I have to insecure... Wait a second, I have to look it up. I will add it later. Okay. Right, well, go ahead. I'll just type it in. I'll okay. type it in whatever, just the words, just use English okay. words and we'll do it. Okay, so first of all, uh, API server protection, making sure that authentic, only authenticated users get answers from the API server. Uh, this is one thing. Um, which, which also, in which we all usually include also um the enforcement of of our uh, our buck um which we can discuss whether it is how deep it is related or not but from what from our perspective it is important to enforce that the the Kubernetes cluster uses our buck and anonymous user is it doesn't have any access rights um and the second is actually is not is is um is removing public internet access from from uh, from API server, so uh, you know from the public internet you cannot access uh, the API server itself, um, which are with thing thing that the, these are two ba very very basic. The Kubernetes API server. Yeah. So again, this is in the sense of telcos. It is an, I think that it's less of an issue. Okay, but but still, I think that. This is something as a best practice. It's something that you know should be there and should be clear to everyone. Um, and also, okay, we 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 suggested also to make sure that every uh, Kubernetes control plane component, like uh, you know, kubelets and and scheduler and control manager and stuff like each talking to each other in TLS with uh, with uh, bilateral authentication. Which with is, what uh, authentication? TLS with what? Um, mutual TLS. Oh. Uh, so in order to make sure that the, this is, you know, the, the things which we saw that these are really the, um, the 101 of, of, of the network security around the Kubernetes components. And these should be enforced. I will. I will follow up and I will add. Okay, the controls um, we are adding right now, also to make sure that these are uh, covered in our test kit. But um, this is a, as again, this is a best practice. So, um, for example, a public access to uh, to Kubernetes API server is not necessarily something okay that can be easily tested, um, since you know. How do you prove that you don't have public access? Um, uh, you cannot cover cover this, you know, hundred um, percent. 
uh, yeah, these were the things which which I thought would be you know good things to to best uh, for best practices. All right. Um, I actually think that some of those might be related to stuff uh, we had listed for least privilege. Yeah. Uh, so like the API access, that's um, similar. It's not exact, but that's similar. So that's good. Continue on that. Um, security controls, yeah. Um, I feel like there was something about our back. I'm not seeing it now, but maybe it was in the actual notes. Yeah. Here we go. Look at this. So we have um, been, we have this whole section here in these working notes on our back roles and authentication and a pretty, pretty decent write up in several sections about this. Awesome. So um, this would be content that could be pulled for something like around our back. And we get, there's a lot of things on our back. So we can, the more specific we get on something, um, you know, potentially the easier it is, but what, whatever, whatever it is, I think we got a lot of content on our back. Okay. Um. And, and likewise, um, Sagar, we have, um, I think on these like drop all capabilities, uh, if I look up these, well, number one, we have like exceptions and stuff, which um, Ian was talking about, like when, uh, what do we do with all the applications that need it right now? This no privilege or capabilities granted. So this is kind of related to that what you're suggesting. It's pretty much the same, but it's definitely something we've thought would be good. And I think there's probably other content here besides the uh, supply chain attack. So if you can, you, you probably take this non root as a, a, a good example. There's also literally like here's, here's the template that anyone can use that explains what it's about. Um, actually, here's the template. And this says, what's the process? What do we want? But here's the template. And, and this yeah, is a, a uh, good link Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I was saying um, if you could share that link uh, for the template. That would yeah, be sure. I'll just drop these all in here. So um, example, um, or creating creating a, a new um, best practice proposal. So example, non root. Uh, so we have a, a template. Uh, let me grab that. So probably um, user story example, supply chain attacks. The, all of these can be adjusted to as needed. When we created this, it was without before having an example. So um, we have this section, user stories, use cases, it can be whatever makes sense. The, the main point here is, uh, I'm not seeing it, there we go. To give context to the end user, okay, why is this relevant? This best practice, yes. relevancy. But if if you are giving relevance in another way, that's okay. These are just to help guide us, but it's not strictly required. There's some of the things that we've marked as required. And if you feel like it's not relevant, then come back. Um, same thing, Ben, on anything that you all come up with here. 
it's not relevant, then just come back. It's mm -hmm. we're trying to we're trying to give recommendations with enough content that people can say, oh, I understand why this is a great idea. Yeah, let yeah. me adopt that. Across across our company, we think it's a great idea. Yeah. All right. Does, is there any other ideas for potential practices that anyone wants to, and it doesn't have to be, a, some of these are, I would say more security um, oriented. So we don't have to just do that, but any, any ideas, whether it's more security or other stuff that people want to put forward and say, this would be a really good one for people yeah, to adopt. I um, there was one more um, which um, which requires read-only root file system. I don't know if that's already part of the CNCF test fit. Require uh, read -only. potentially. Um, I I don't know on the test suite side. There's a lot of different things there. But what what is it if we're talking about it from a, a best practice standpoint? So this you policy. Can just try to say it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this policy ensures that um, you know there is only uh, you only have a uh, um, read-only root file system. All right. Yeah, that's all. I th yeah, this is. Um, I think there's agreement between many different projects. Um, Kyverno, um, Cubescape. I think y'all have something about read-only. Falco yeah. has read-only. So if we have you know a lot of different projects that are focused on Kubernetes and cloud native and everyone is saying you should have, you should do this, then it's probably a good indication that it's a best practice. Use read only root file systems. Right. All right. I think Taylor, uh, there are others as well, but um, let me pull those one second. So Taylor, can you go back to that uh, Caverno uh, website in the best practice? Yeah, th these are uh, checking the deprecated APIs is one of them. Ben, would you um add a link under this armo uh cubescape area to i think you'll have a best practice um set yep and, and you I, could put it right here and then people can go check those out sure okay i will do thanks All right, so uh, check for deprecated APIs. All right, and I know that there's several um, projects for this too. Um, there's been, there's one project that's actually used with the SIG testing for checking uh, test coverage for all Kubernetes APIs, and it can tell you whether it's alpha, beta, or production. I'm not sure if it checks for um, deprecated APIs, but that's great that 
Averno can do that. So check for deprecated APIs. I think that would definitely be one from an audit standpoint for service providers. They'd get noted if, if an application's using that so that they'd be warned from an ops team perspective if, before they upgrade their platform, what applications are gonna break. and what may have more bugs potentially, I guess. Yeah, so, um, so Taylor, I, um, I think uh, one more thing was I was working on um, integrating those policies, right? I have made some progress on that, um, especially, you know, formatting the output, I think with the help of uh, Akash and Drew, um, now it's more formatted. Um, so I'll, I'll update my, uh, policies accordingly uh, and probably show like a demo sometime this Thursday. Uh, will that be okay? All right. Does anyone have anything else? So even if you're dropping capabilities, it's still a good idea to uh, to not use root. Um, there's other issues besides capabilities that uh, that come in. Yeah, that's why we're going to keep it separate. Best practice: drop capabilities. Uh, don't set your container privilege to true. Don't use root. We just keep piling them on. So the more you use, the safer you're going to be. Perfect. And someone may decide to only use a, a subset. That's fine, as long as we can tell. What are you? What are you doing? Any yeah, other best practices that in, anyone uh, wants to mention? In, in the fourth one, not just often, only authenticated users, but also and uh, and services, because not every not everything that connects to Kubernetes API is, is a user. So, uh, granted, I guess we can map them to a user, so it may not make too much sense, but. So one more would be, basically restricting the image registries that you typically pull your images from. I'm sorry, can you say that again? Um, restrict image registries. Let me ping you the link on a second. Limit the I, I registries that you the can the get ideas. images from, which is a perfectly good way of ensuring supply chain security. So. Or, or assisting on it. Yeah, I just uh, pinged in the chat. Yeah, the point is to, to limit uh, from which image registry someone can pull to the pods. Um, yeah, you can go all the way to the end. Yeah, that's all. All right, I'd probably argue against this one. I want public and secure, but that has to do with <laughs> signing and other stuff. Yeah, um, it depends on, uh, Taylor, it certainly depends on how you play this game. But on the other yeah. hand, um, if you- We put it forward though. Yeah. Yeah, signing, signing may not be enough in some, in some use cases. Absolutely. Um, and so, for example, I, I may we may end up with a with a signed um, root image, or let's say like you pick a database, and I won't give a specific database name, but let's say you have like uh, some database that you use, and that database were to be compromised and, uh, and an image uploaded, then you start pulling from that specific one rather than the ones that you vet. So, generally, what ends up happening is that 
the there's additional scans that are put onto the private repo and the organization may want to ensure that those scans are performed before they deploy anything so they won't want to pull from public for for that specific reason even if they're not modifying the images themselves yeah i think it's questionable how well it's any more secure than basically signing things as trusted because you've done the scan I, it's a, I, it's a I definitely of like the idea of ha um, having a trusted testing place that signs after testing, scanning and testing. But anyways, we're getting into how would you design all of this. And restrict image registries is definitely a, a way of helping to secure. <sighs> different paths. So any others that someone wants to put forward? And if you think of something later, then you can feel free to come in and add it to the notes or go into another good place to add it later would be put a discussion item. If it's related to something here, feel free to add it or just create a new discussion area. And then we can talk about it, you know, a following week. If you really think this is a really good one, we definitely should do this, then please go add an issue. So we have, we actually have one about privilege flag that Ian added quite a while ago. Don't use privilege. So this is one that we could, the privilege flag specifically. So that that capabilities one, the very first one, might be something that we already agree. You should drop capabilities. So go ahead and create an issue that we should propose as a best practice. And then you can start iterating on it with a draft um, that you can share and we can all work towards uh, creating. And then we create a pull request and we'll be good to go. So with that, Ian, why don't you go ahead and open the pull request? We'll move on. We're nearly at the top of the hour. Open what pull request exactly? Oh, review the open pull request. Yes, okay. Well, there is in fact only one, which is uh, the one that uh, we've had open for a while to create air-gapped environments. Oh, well, sorry. The, um, the pull request is called create air-gapped environments, big pardon. But yes, to, to discuss the best practice of using an air-gapped environment and the implications that it has. Um, I don't think there's much worth discussing on this meeting. And in any case, I don't think in six minutes we would get very far. Um, but, um, and it looks like we've got a few open uh, bits of commentary that haven't been addressed in the pull request at this point in time. Um, but I think I would just simply suggest that people have a read of it if they didn't know it existed or if they haven't looked already um, to get a sense of where it's going and just so that they can add their own comments on it. So this is um, user stories which potentially could be referenced by any of the best practices that we've been talking about or other best practices later. Yeah, I mean, I think what Jeff, I, I'm not, I'm just skimming this. I have to admit, I'm a bit lax on this. I haven't done my own review, but uh, I'm just skimming this. And I think his um, his storytelling needs a bit of work. But the idea is that we know in many, if not all service providers, that when they're doing network functions of whatever kind of software, they don't just pull it from the internet. Um, and they certainly don't pull it on the internet from the end device. They They basically distribute it within their network, which is a closed system that they only um, allow new software images to enter under limited circumstances. Um, and that was the point that Jeff was trying to get across. Uh, 
Um, but yes, anyway, this one's open. Um, it's uh, up for review as we speak. So uh, anyone who's got the time to basically read through it and see whether it makes any sense to them, that would be useful. Um, and we, again, are right at the top of the hour, give or take. Um, so um, unless there's anything particularly urgent that people want to talk to talk about for three minutes, then um, I think we might be done for the morning. Spelling, grammar, any type of updates are appreciated if it makes it more readable. If you see yes. a word that you think needs a definition, put it in, whatever, any of that will help. Yeah, absolutely. Don't feel that you, you can propose a change in GitHub and I strongly suggest you do. Um, if you are doing um, comments, then uh, you know simply putting the change you would like to see is often for small changes a lot easier than basically telling someone else that they've got work to do. So, um, you know, uh, do do make sure you do that. Can you demonstrate, Taylor? Yeah, that thing. I will do so. Yeah. So this little insert suggestion, and then I can say air gapped um, places. And then if I put that as my suggestion, it shows up like this. And then someone can click that has access can click commit suggestions if they like it. It makes it um, real easy to for folks to move along and quickly take stuff that's um, been put in there. We can have fast iterations of changes. So please use those. And if you're not using them in your own, then I suggest you do so with your pull request. And if you mess up, you can always delete and try again, like I just did. All right, I think we're at the end. Unless anyone that's muted needs something, has anything else. All right, Ian, I think we did it. Okay, thank you everybody. And we will see you all next week. Thank you guys. Thanks everyone. See ya. Take care.